and he has been involved in a lot of other activities, especially policy, monetary policy work in Norway. Uh, we are very happy to have him. He uh, actually he has limited time. I appreciate the fact that he came all the way from his country, Washington D.C., and going back to Washington D.C. And here we have him to uh, share his thoughts about uh, the subject matter of our conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so. Uh, I hope you enjoy the food. I'll try to be less enjoyable than the food. Um, so uh, I'm a central banker. Uh, central bankers are generally conservative. The Norwegian central bankers are forced to be less conservative. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to talk to you from the bird's eye view of a regulator. It doesn't know much about technology, but I think, I believe, I imagine, I know something about monetary systems. So I guess that is my field of expertise. Uh, my colleague from Canada said he was a dinosaur in terms of, I guess I'm far older than that. So uh, you can think of me as the old cynic uh, who's trying to make sense of all this. Um, but in my country, uh, it is also the case that we have a very advanced payment system. Uh, along with Sweden, we are sort of the world leaders in abandoning cash. Uh, at the present time, last time we counted, uh, about 2% of our M2 was cash. The rest was electronic. So, uh, being an old but realistic cynic, I have to re realize I have to acknowledge that in about 10 to 15 years' time, we won't be using cash. Uh, so that is uh, uh, a challenge we have to face as central bankers. So, which is why we have we have been interesting in this subject. So, what I'm trying to do is, from a, an economist point of view, what does all this mean actually? How do we make sense of all that's going on? Uh, and what is what are the underlying rationales for what is going on? Um, and what is the role, if any, of regulation? And then, the, as a central banker, there's always this suspicion that this is old wine in new bottles. Uh, the first the world, the world's first central bank. Uh, which is, happens to be our neighbor, uh, the Swedish Riksbank, 350 years old this year, was founded uh, on, on money fraud. Basically a Dutch guy coming up with new technology. At that time that was the, the, the art of printing. Uh, and he printed money for the king who waged wars and didn't have any fine other means of financing. That guy ended up with, uh, he was eventually, um, um, uh, convicted uh, for execution, um, and he was pardoned by the king who, because he financed his wars. So, so there are some issues here. It's my point is there. It's always been extremely attractive to make money for the simple reason that then you can pay without actually having any means, right? Uh, so this is always uh, the central bankers' suspicion. But I'm not. I'm going to be less less skeptic than that. So let's, let's begin. First, uh, you, 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 several people here have, have referred to Nakamoto. I, let me just state that. Okay, so we're actually at, ten, at the 10 year jubilee now. Uh, it's, it's about 10 years since the white paper on Bitcoin. Uh, and my question is, while this idea is novel uh, and interesting, has it actually achieved what he set out to do? Uh, I think Nolan, um, just before lunch, made an interesting case. Uh, but I still question it. Has Bitcoin actually achieved what it set out to do? Uh, in particular, 
and are we actually facing a system totally without trusted parties? I'm not sure, actually. Um, and the other question that I have that several other people have raised, are cryptocurrencies really currencies? Or are they something else? So, uh, this has been touched upon by several others, so I won't. But money, money is a medium of exchange. It's a, it's a way, it's the way we pay, it's the medium we pay with. It's a unique and only content and store of value. Uh, and and by, as, as a medium of exchange, at some level, it's based on trust. And I, I will argue that even Bitcoin is actually based on trust, but a different kind of trust. Um, and the other thing is, if you want, as, as means of payment, useful money, useful money uh, has to be commonly in use. Everybody has to use it. Otherwise, if don't people, if, if, if there are a lot of people who actually don't accept your medium of exchange, it's not very useful, right? So there's common commonality. It's important, and it has to be stable. The value you have to know if you if you get money that will, it will be worth approximately the same tomorrow as it is today. That seems. And the payment system, there's a similar thing going on, but just to be short, a, a common payment system has to be open to all, and it has to be understood by all. <coughs> so that's, uh, I think, a high uh, a high demand for some of these systems. Okay, so I'll be talking about money, the payment system, and then something uh, towards the end about risks and regulatory responses. <coughs> this is all going on here. I won't, I won't bore, bore you with all that. But the whole point here is actually that cryptocurrencies, from a monetary point of view, have some particularities. One is that it's actually its own currency. And if you, if you own cryptocurrency, uh, you actually have the claim on no one. Unlike any other currency, you might say that the claim you have on the central bank is a fiat money. It's actually a bit unreal, actually, perhaps. But you do have a claim on some institution. It's your, or a bank, or a central bank. Uh, and uh, if central banks fail their task, i.e. to keep money stable, uh, there will be consequences for that, for that institution. Uh, however, you, I'm, you might argue, like no one did, I think, that actually you do have a claim, not on I mean, any individual or an institution, but you have a claim, you, have, you trust the code. So in a way, you have a sort of a theoretical claim on, on, the, on, crypt, crypt, on cryptography, in a sense. But it, this is very particular and very special for uh, a unit of account or means, or means of payment. So just very brief, these people have talked about this before. So this is just uh, a chart. I'm not sure you can say, see it, but the point is, if you sort of the, by traditional standards, the merits of a currency has to be a medium of exchange unit of account, store of value. So national currencies typically pass those tests. Cryptocurrencies generally don't. They don't work as a general medium of exchange. They don't work as units of accounts. They might work as store of value. Right? And, and so, um, they may contribute positively to a well-distributed portfolio, for instance. Uh, so in that sense, they could be a sort of value. But, but the asset, I would argue, is kind of risky, right? Not just in the sense of you don't know what this value will be tomorrow. Uh, but from a fundamental point of view, I would argue <laughs> there is a significant positive probability that this asset at some point in the future would, will have a value of zero, right? Because it's based on technology, and this kind of technology can at any time 
I believe, um, be out there. So, uh, so there's a, that, that's a sort of fundamental difference from a normal currency. A normal currency. I'm not talking about Venezuela now, but a normal currency. Okay, so <coughs> there's a blue line here on the very close to the zero line. If you can see the dark blue line, that's actually the Norwegian currency towards the dollar. So it's not zero, it's actually 7.18. Uh, but it looks like zero here because we have Bitcoin on the other on the other upper graph. So that's quite remarkable. And then the volatility series again it looks like Norwegian kroner, looks like the zero line. <coughs> and then the the line moving around is actually the weekly uh, volatility of Bitcoin in percentage. So uh, which is quite remarkable again. So again. This doesn't look like a means of payment. It doesn't look like currency, actually, in any meaningful term of that word. So I would argue, along with some of my colleagues, these are actually not currencies. They are assets. Um, and they may be useful as assets. They don't, but they don't fulfill the criteria for useful money in the common sense of that word. So, um, that might be just semantics, but I don't think so. I think it's more useful to think of cryptocurrencies as crypto assets. Um, and the, the question is, what kind of asset are we talking about here, actually? Um, and uh, I, Maybe being a bit philosophical, I think, what are you actually buying if you buy crypto assets? I think Nolan actually answered that quite well. You're buying into a possible future. You're buying into something that might have a big, large value sometime in the future. So for me, uh, this is actually a derivative. Uh, it's, if anything, um, you might term it differently, but for me, this looks like a put option on the future payment system. Uh, and, or if you like, a way to be short the present day payment system. So, did anybody see the, the movie The Big Short here? I'm sure you did. So, Whenever there is a challenge, people in the financial markets try usually come up with uh, the first thing they think about is how can I short this thing? So I think Bitcoin or any other is a, is a way of sh shorting the present day payment system. Okay, I'll just leave that there for you to ponder about. So, more about the payment system. So this is. A traditional chart of what uh, a domestic payment system looks like with individuals <coughs> uh, and in the, at, at the bottom. And then the bank declaring the central bank at the top of the clearing system. This is how the payment system works. I won't go into detail here. <coughs> and then the merits, similarly. Uh, I'm sorry if you can't see that, it's a bit too much light here. But the left col column, this is again about the, the merits. You have the left column is the, in terms of the domestic system. The middle col column is about uh, cross-border. And then the right column is about cryptocurrencies. So I'll try to take you to this, through this in some detail. So first, <clears throat> today's payment system passes most tests when it comes to domestic use, i.e. single currency transactions. Uh, except maybe when it comes to rapidity, because I will argue that today, uh, in, in most transactions that involve banks, we're talking about hours up to maybe a day for money to go from one holder of account to another account. Uh, we're working in Scandinavia and in Europe uh, about 
developing a more rapid uh, uh, settlement <coughs> system. So immediate settlements is the key word here. Um, if all goes well, we will have uh, an, a universal system of immediate payments, immediate settlements in two years. So we're working on that. Uh, so then ours will be green and US will be 10 years behind. Okay. <laughs> so you have, you have some catching up to do, actually. Uh, but look at the cross-border. So we have a real problem with cross-border payments. The, the present day system is not cost efficient. There are a lot of agents in between who want their cut, all of them, and, and there are a lot of fat cats in that system. Um, and I think this is what cryptocurrencies are exploiting in terms of our payment system, is precisely uh, the the, the lack of an efficient cross-border payment system. Cross-border meaning evolving more than one currency. <clears throat> so, um, but it, it's, it's not cost efficient. It costs a hell of a lot to actually do these transactions or, or, or find the currency. It's, as we've heard, it's not actually very safe. And it's not user-friendly in the sense that, it, that everybody can use it. It, it is user-friendly to a small number of people. But it's not generally user-friendly. So you need intermediate. Again, you need somebody you can trust, actually. But it is faster, in some cases, uh, than, than the ordinary system. So some cryptocurrencies, you can do international transfers in a matter of hours, which is not the case uh, today with uh, the ordinary payment system. And also there is this question about anonymity, or as Nolan said, sort of push transactions. So the, that, the, that is really ambiguous, right? <coughs> um, we all value anonymity. So, <coughs> So that's user-friendly to some users who we like, but it's also user-friendly <laughs> to some users with whom we don't want to be friends, right? Uh, so there's an issue here about legality that is real and that regulators need to address, and it, that is a real uncertainty for the whole system. Uh, I, I think and I think this is a key issue. And it, it shows that the marketplace that is being developed here needs to be regulated. Actually, every marketplace needs to be regulated somehow, right? Either voluntarily by the market participants themselves, <coughs> like the changes, or by some authority. Um, I think a typical example, just to show you what I mean, the um, one of the reasons why, maybe not all of them, but one of the reasons why Bitcoin caught a lot of attention in last year, 2017, was the fact that the WannaCry malware, which exploded last autumn, wanted payment in Bitcoin. Okay? Now, it doesn't take you long to realize why they wanted payment in Bitcoin, because that's not traceable, right? Well, actually, it is traceable to some extent. And some of those payments were traced. They were traced to a, a casino in the Philippines. But from there, it was impossible. So, so there is a real issue about illicit activity that has to be addressed for this to become a success. <clears throat> OK. So let's forget about this thing about payment system. Let's assess cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, uh, excluding the payment system. So I would say we end up with some very nice properties when it comes to cross-border payments, if 
those other issues can be solved. And those issues might result in transactions not being anonymous anymore. Okay? I don't think global regulators will put up with the fact that you have, if you have a large number of transactions that are not traceable, that's like saying it's okay to invest in tax havens. Okay? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so, this, the, 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 eventual, the final system might look a little bit different than it does now. But then, as several has mentioned, I think the technology itself <coughs> is extremely interesting, also for a lot more uh, uses that we have today, including interbank clearing, settlements, collateral administration, and even for authorities, things like anti-money laundering systems. Because DLT could be used by banks to share uh, a list, right, without actually uh, compromising anonymity. So that though the technology, DLT technology has, has a lot of, uh, going for it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to spend the last five to ten minutes on how to deal with the risks associated with this. First, <coughs> two users. I'm trying to sum up here. Extreme volatility. Clearly, at least a suspicion that it, this boils down to a Ponzi scheme. Okay? <coughs> the fact that early entrants are rewarded, uh, whereas the late comers will pay all the price, is kind of suspicious to regulate. Okay? This doesn't look too good. There's this thing about fraud and operational failures. So there are obvious risks to the user. For society, I mentioned this problem with illicit activities. That has to be addressed somehow. There's an issue <coughs> with waste. It takes tremendous energy for no apparent reason to mine these things. It doesn't have to be like that. It's, it doesn't have to be that costly to produce money. Uh, and then there is the issue of systemic risk. At what point does this threaten the, the stability of the financial system as such? So, that's, of course, the main concern of central bankers. Is this actually a channel for new systemic risk? So there are sort of three channels that are really worrying if they happen. One is if we start to see cryptocurrencies on banks' balance sheets, indir either directly or indirectly, i.e. through uh, cryptocurrencies being, being financed by bank loans. Uh, so far, we're, we're okay, but this is a worry. So the next level is if you have cryptocurrencies in FMI settlements, uh, so then it will start to intervene in the infrastructure. That will typically be the case if cryptocurrencies are being used as collateral. Uh, and there will be operational risk in the system. And then the sort of final risk where it's really troublesome is if you use cryptocurrencies in mainstream payments without having solved the issues of operational risk, including fraud and all that, then we're in real trouble. So those are sort of the, 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 the main risks we're facing. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about this regulatory approach. I don't have time for that. But there are several means to regulate. It's not that we can't regulate it. I don't believe. We can't, reg we can't regulate the code itself, obviously. But we can regulate institutions. Banks. 
changes legal uh, legal structures. So there is a case to be made for regulation. I think the question is not whether we will have regulation on this, but what it will look like. I think uh, the main point is that any regulation has to have a global standard. Otherwise, we, have, we will have the same problem as we have had with tax habits. So we need a, a level playing field. The, the, the Financial Stability Board under the G, G20 has gone a long way in trying to work on this and identify the metrics. I think that is extremely useful. They are working hard. Something will happen. So I have, uh, again, you probably won't see because of the light, but Governor Carney uh, of the Bank of England, who has been chair of the FSB for a long time, has said something that I think is incredibly wise, so I have to put it on that. He says, a better path would be to regulate elements of the crypto asset ecosystem to combat illicit activities, promote market integrity, and protect the safety and soundness of the financial system. So that sounds very nice, right? The question is, how do you do that? So it's not easy to regulate. Uh, illicit activities have to be combated for, for governments to, to be able to acknowledge the system. Uh, which means, I think, as a minimum, governments must be able to monitor large cross-border payments. That is a must. Uh, so that we will have to find a solution how to do. But, and that's an important but, we have to do this in a way that don't stifle innovation. So I'm, I'm uh, a Scandinavian, we don't like regulation either. Okay. Uh, so, so we only regulate if we must. I think we must, but we have to be careful to allow this incredible technology to continue to develop. So then I would say just a few words. So regulation may not be the only response we have. Um, I think what I've said is that this phenomenon of DLT and cryptocurrencies, they illustrate some of the weaknesses of our present system. Uh, not the least cross-border. So instead of regulating these technologies, we could be more open-minded perhaps and say, okay, what are these developments teaching us as central bankers? And uh, some of us have said, okay, the answer to this is to develop our own our money, the money we make, to fit those new descriptions. So we've come up with a, a work plan together with the Swedes on, on digital central bank. <coughs> so there's, there are a lot of issues there, so I don't have time to go into that. But as I said, we're, we're in the country, I'm, I'm, I'm the elected governor of a country that 10, 15 years from now won't be using cash. So the, the, big, the, the question is, do we actually need central bank money, and what kind of central bank money? And that might actually be uh, a big lesson here for us. So uh, I've been learning today, I will have been learning before, I hope, and I will continue to learn because I think we have a lot to learn from this development, and it's exciting to be here. Okay. <coughs> To sum up, currently our money and payment system work reasonably well, but it's room for improvement, cross-border. I think there is a case, I think technology here is actually making a case for digital money in general. Crypto assets are risky, they need to be regulated, but in an intelligent way that doesn't destroy technological development. Thank you.
time for a few questions if you have uh, any specific question. Can you please raise your voice or together? One of the things you discussed was uh, increasing the rapidness with which you're able to, to transact from a couple hours or a day now to almost instantaneous. What do you see the risks are in those that way? Very few. I think we solved it, actually. But it's it's a question of um, the the real issue here is contingency. If when you know if you have a, a, an immediate settlement system, right? So in in two years' time, you come to Norway, you can pay anything you want, anything <coughs> from a chewing gum to a house, with your mobile phone. Okay, and that's I can't think of anything easier than that. And it's, it will be safe, it will be reasonably safe. Now sometimes that system will fail because of our mobile company or something, but then you're always going to revert back to old technology, so that's not the problem. I think the real issue is uh, contingency. When you do away with cash, if your electronic payment system fails, you have nothing, you don't have a contingency. So, so that's one of the things we're struggling with in terms of of digital money, do we need a second line that will be kept open even when the banks are being attacked by the Russians? So we'll put it, you, know, so you don't see a risk of what if this person doesn't have, like chewing gum, fine, but this person doesn't have the money to actually buy that house, and you're. And oh no, but the, we will check that. I mean, it's not, you know, it's like, you know, the the, the check won't pass. The check will fail. So there's another question. Uh, I wonder what you think about using index funds as currency backing is to gold. It's flexible, it will grow or shrink with the uh, economy, uh, and so on and so forth. It, it, uh, the central bankers, of course, cling to the idea that they are the only ones who wish to avoid counterfeiting, but uh, uh, it seems to me that this uh, proposal has at least that much advantage. I, I'm not sure I actually understand the question, sir. I'm sorry. Can you explain what, what you mean? Instead of having a gold standard, having a standard of index funds, Okay, so they're mean, international at like one stroke. They, they become international, <laughs> and uh, they have value that, which shrinks and expands with the value of the economy. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically, you're saying that we should we should tie the value of money to the real economy somehow. Yes. Uh, index fund being. Yeah. Uh, there is. A lot of merit to that idea. I, I, the, the problem with that idea, I mean, we've been considering, say, nominal GDP targeting in Norway, intellectually, I have to say. Uh, the problem with that is that politicians won't let us take the control of the economy because if we control nominal GDP, what's their job? <laughs> so that's the problem, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but you know, given that cash is going to disappear in your country, um, does that pose um, difficulties in terms of your management of uh, monetary policy that, that you think um, are really problematic, or is this fairly easy to manage? So, so, I, uh, so. Uh, Cash is 2% of our economy, okay? So if, if that's the problem, we already have it. And I, I, we seem to be able to control the price level. To put it that way. So I don't think so. I think, I think if you have bank money who are actually, I mean, we so heavily regulated that people actually trust the banks, we're fine. So that's not, I don't think that's an issue. 
Have you guys thought about uh, the, the new monetary, like the, the ability to influence the economy? If you have digital cash, you can do, do it direct to like a kind of universal basic income type stimulus or localized? And, or... Yeah, so I guess you're talking the question in terms of digital money here again. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but the problem, so the problem if, if the central bank, so we can make digital money easily accessible to everyone, right? So everybody can have an account in the central bank. That sounds terrific. Except that is the mother of all bankrupts, okay? Basically, you're saying, you're telling the population to take all their money out of the banks and put it in the sense. So we don't want to do that, okay? That transition is going to be difficult, uh, to say the least. So, so we, we, we're not that radical. We have, uh, you know, one more question. We have time for one more question. You know, thank you. Uh, the, the, this is a question really a follow-up on this, about what's your view about uh, the issuance of central bank digi digi digital currency. It would seem on one hand that uh, this would solve uh, some of the, uh, the problems of uh, <coughs> excessive regulation, because then if, when the central bank uh, issues its own you know, currency, uh, and you know, since uh, this digital currency is going to be supported by, uh, by public institutions, it's probably going to dominate to, to, to a large extent, you know, the private issue, the, the currency, so regulation is going to be much less necessary. On the other hand, there is a uh, trade-off, which you just mentioned, and that is that uh, <clears throat> if there is a bank run or something like that, that uh, all the money is going to go to the central bank and uh, uh, that there will be problems with, with the banks. So the question is, uh, what is your position along this trade-off? So, uh, this, these questions are tough. Uh, it, it would take me half an hour to answer it properly. Uh, we have been thinking about this for the last year. I, um, I guess the bottom line is, it's probably not a good idea for the central bank to be the banking system. Uh, bankers, private sector, do that better, I think than bureaucrats. Uh, so I, I, I hesitate to advocate that. So I think we need a banking system, we need bank money. So in that case, we also need bank regulation, unfortunately. As I say, banks make their own money, that's basically why they need to regulate or regulate it. Uh, I would just say we are, so this is the commercial. Um, we have been doing some work on this. Uh, we have a, a preliminary report coming out in English, I think, hopefully this month, uh, maybe early May. So if you look, go on the Norges Bank webpage, you will find something interesting, I hope. Uh, but it's just the first step. We haven't operationalized it, and that's where the real trouble lies. Thank you very much. Thank you.